Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network with Octo and as well as editor of Octo's newsletter, the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. And we also have today Nick Weiner from Octo who is uh, helping with the webinar. And we're very pleased to have Carol Lee Shumway uh, from the Center for Behavior and Climate here to speak about behavior change for climate action for the oceans and beyond. Um, before I turn it over to Carol Lee, I wanted to let everyone know um, how to ask questions. So you can send questions, we'll have the presentation by Carol Lee, and then uh, you can send in questions uh, through the question and answer um, uh, panel in the, in the user interface, and I can re relay those to Carol Lee, or you can send them in through the chat interface, um, and I, I will relay those also. Now the chat interface, you, you're allowed to send chats to other attendees. Um, and we encourage you to share useful information um, related to the topic of the webinar uh, in the chat. Um, but uh, please keep it professional uh, because we've enabled this option. Um, and we'll also have some interactive polls, which we're excited to see responses for. So um, thank you everyone for being here and, and welcome, Carolee. I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I want to thank Dr. Carr and Octo for the invitation to give this lecture to you today. Just to give you a bit of background on me, I'm a third generation oceanographer with a background in behavioral neuroscience. Um, I've been applying behavioral principles to conservation since I wrote about it in 1999, and I've been and I'm now applying it to climate change. I've led marine and freshwater NGOs, and I was the chief scientist for USAID's Global Development Lab focusing on innovations and international development. Our mission at the Center for Behavior and Climate is transformative education, translating behavior and environmental science insights for multiple audiences. We've created a five hour free online behavior change for climate action course for professionals and students and also offer it as workshops or as a supplement to university courses. I am giving you a whirlwind tour of this course today. We'll be stopping several times to do some exercises along the way, and I've also provided some marine examples indicated by a blue scallop on the top right of the slide. So let's get started. Why include behavior at all in climate change? Because human behavioral considerations cut across all aspects of the climate crisis. This figure from the American Psychological Association's Climate Change Task Force shows all of the many intersections between behavioral understanding and climate change, from drivers of climate change and climate impacts, the yellow boxes at the top, to individual societal and cultural factors in mitigation and adaptation, the green box and ovals at the bottom. Why should you include behavior change in climate actions, including policy and management? Because the only way to solve this climate crisis is through behavior change and social change. We need behavior change skills to facilitate support and implementation of climate actions by the general public, the private sector, and the public sectors. The International Energy Agency's Net Zero by 2050 report notes that it's ultimately people who drive demand for energy-related goods and services, and societal norms and personal choices will play a pivotal role in steering the energy system onto a sustainable path. Consider trying to get a bill passed to include the cost of carbon in your product. You know that Republicans favor this approach to climate change, so you call it the carbon tax initiative. The bill fails. Republicans actually oppose it. But what if you had called the bill the carbon offset initiative instead? Partisan resistance to a proposed climate change bill can hinge upon how the issue is framed. Framing a climate bill as a carbon tax or a carbon offset affects its popularity across ideological groups. 
with the former framing of attacks only being supported by Democrats, that's the bars on the left, while the latter framing as an offset garners support across all ideological groups. Behavioral barriers can be one of the greatest barriers to institutional climate action as well. Ekstrom and Moser surveyed five municipal government agencies in California to identify the greatest institutional barriers to climate adaptation. At the top are the number of barriers identified by these municipal staff to action on climate adaptation. The different colored gray bars are staff responses from the five different municipal agencies. As shown by the red arrow, the second most important barrier blocking action were behavioral barriers related to attitudes, values, and intentions of the actors involved, such as lack of interest, status quo mindset, inability to accept change, and narrow self-interest. Note that a lack of climate change understanding or a lack of climate science understanding were not the main barriers holding the agencies back from climate action, as shown by the purple arrows. A similar analysis was recently done by Fulton 2021 on behavioral barriers hindering institutional adoption of ecosystem-based fisheries management, including path dependence and cognitive biases. Who uses behavior change tools? Utilities, nonprofits, government agencies, and marketers are applying behavior change tools to policy management and public behavior worldwide. And in the marine realm, Fisheries researchers, nonprofits, and aquaria. I used to work at the New England Aquarium um, and uh, led an exhibit on the, to try to encourage public change on aquatic biodiversity. The left figure shows the frequency and type of tool used by utilities and government agencies in Europe, Canada, and Australia. The right tools recommended for US energy utilities with the purple stars indicating those behavior change tools most often applied and applicable. What causes behavior change? Intention predicts one third of the variance of pro-environmental behavior as determined by a regression model by Bamberg and Moser. This model shows that attitudes, moral norms influenced by social norms and perceived behavioral control or feeling like you have the ability to do something predict over 50% of the variance in intention. I'm showing you a simplified version of their model here. Now this is only one theory of behavior change, but it has strong predictive value and it's derived from two widely supported theories which are shown below. Other variables influence behavior. And as you can see from this slide, a lot. Who are you trying to change? The audience. The first step in using a behavior change process is consider who you're trying to change. For climate change, we can broadly separate the audience into two. The converted, those who are already worried about and care about climate change, and the disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. In 2019, most Americans and the world, actually, and for America, 73% fall into the converted camp. For this audience, the good news is we don't have to spend time arguing the science of climate change. But the converted's behavior doesn't reflect their concern. What we need to do is motivate this audience to action. What are you trying to change? The behavior. There are three types of behaviors to consider. Daily continuous behaviors to reduce carbon emissions, such as habits. One-off behaviors to avoid carbon emissions, such as getting solar panels. And periodic, ooh, and periodic behaviors, such as public actions or engaging in nature-based efforts to sequester carbon, such as with blue carbon restoration. How do we know what behavioral approach works? In 2012, Espels, Distin, and Schott conducted a meta-analysis of behavioral effectiveness for the pro-environmental behaviors shown here. I'm gonna show you a modified table from their paper that shows an analysis of 10 behavior change tools. And it's organized by the type of tool that it is. You can see the four types of tools listed here, tools of convenience, information, monitoring, and social psychological tools. The second row shows the behavior change tools. Right now you're just seeing two. Before I describe the tools, you notice there's two sets of numbers for each tool. The top number shows the total number of studies out of 87 studies that they looked at. And the bottom number shows the statistical effect 
in standard deviation units, I've highlighted with red font any effect size that was medium to large. So tools of convenience are two tools, making it easy, making behaviors easier to do by, for example, putting recycling bins in a more convenient spot and prompts, verbal or written reminders near the intended behavior, either in time or space. For example, I have a post-it note on my washing machine reminding my family to use the cold wash cycle. Tools of information are tools describing why you should engage in a given behavior or how you engage in that behavior. Monitoring tools are those that provide something in response to a given behavior. Rewards are any kind of monetary gain that people receive as a result of completing the behavior. And feedback provides information about the progress someone has made over a given time frame. Note that financial rewards or incentives can be used as an initial bridge to encourage someone to change their behavior. However, studies show that the behavior will return to its baseline as soon as that reward is eliminated. So to maintain a behavior over the long term requires encouraging intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic or autonomous motivation predicts higher frequency of pro-environmental behavior, increased task persistence, well-being, and social psychological health. And social psychological tools involve another person interacting in some way that influences the behavior. These tools include social modeling, cognitive dissonance, commitments, and setting goals. Social modeling is watching or learning about how others behave to learn how to behave yourself. Cognitive dissonance is a state of tension that occurs whenever a person holds two thoughts that are psychologically inconsistent. People try to avoid cognitive dissonance as much as possible by changing their behavior, that's what you want them to do, or changing the rationale. Commitment is the binding of an individual to a certain behavior, and setting goals is setting a predetermined, specific, measurable, and challenging outcome. So you can see that the four most effective techniques overall are prompts, social modeling, cognitive dissonance, and setting goals. I'm now including three new tools to this list proven to be effective. That's in the purple font on the right-hand side. Games can reach people currently practicing low levels of pro-environmental behavior. And block leaders and community interventions are subsets of, a social, of social modeling tools, and I'll explain those later. This slide shows a very handy graphic modified from Schultz that allows you to match the behavior change tool to the audience and situation. The matching process considers barriers and benefits. Barriers are on the y-axis and refer to anything that reduces the probability of your audience engaging in that target behavior. Barriers such as cost, time, difficulty making the behavior change, or lack of access. Benefits on the x-axis refer to a person's beliefs about the positive outcomes associated with the behavior, saving money, protecting the environment, getting social approval, et cetera. And the appropriate tool to use then is for a barrier benefit combination are the tools in that respective quadrant, such as this one. What behavior tools have been shown to be most effective for home energy conservation? These are shown by the double asterisks. A 20% behavior change can be induced through games, commitments, goal setting, feedback, and community interventions. What social interventions have been shown to be most effective? These are shown by the yellow stars. Commitments, social modeling, and block leaders have been shown to be the most effective. So let's think about what types of action each quadrant might apply to. If you have both barriers and benefits high, examples of behaviors here include changing habits and switching to green energy. When barriers are low, benefits are high. Examples include switching to a low carbon diet and washing clothes in cold water. When barriers are high, benefits are low. Examples include buying a hybrid or electric car or energy conservation. And when both barriers and benefits are low, examples include solar panels and public action. So you use this tool to identify the barriers and benefits for your audience and then figure out which tools would work in that context. Now we're going to look at eight key influencing factors 
which are the barriers holding people back from action and the behavioral tools to counter these factors. And these are the factors we're gonna look at. In the marine realm, Batista et al. 2021 recently conducted an analysis of the influencing factors, they call them drivers, and, and behavior change tools to counter illegal fishing. Ask me about this in the question period and I, I'll show you the slide. Many of the behaviors we're trying to change are daily behaviors, transportation, food choices, energy use, diet, and they're strongly habitual. Roughly 40% of daily behaviors are habits. You know how hard it is to change your own habit. Why is this? People are constrained by this ability chain summarized by fog. The time it takes to change a new habit, the mental and physical effort of changing a current routine and the cost. And there are four necessary components to breaking a habit. First, people must want to be able to change a given behavior, otherwise it won't happen. What you can do here is offer choices. A great example to offer choices is this cool climate calculator from Berkeley. Um, it provides a list of climate actions, the tons of CO2 saved, the dollars saved per year and the upfront costs. You can pledge, um, you can pledge and keep track of the pledges that you make on the website. And the actions of the different arrows show you the detail behind how they came up with a number and also give you some way to personalize to make sure that the numbers are more relevant to you. Second, they must be able to change the behavior. Some changes are hard. One way to do this is with nudges and choice architecture. Third, they may need to be prompted to change the behavior until it becomes a habit. Here you can use prompts, goal setting, or commitments. Fourth, they need to feel good about the change so it's self-motivating. Otherwise, the change is not long lasting. When you feel good about a change, it, you tap into the dopamine reward pathway of your brain, the same pathway your brain uses for other things that feel pleasurable. People are more likely to sustain a behavior if they feel good about it. One way you can tap into this to make people feel good is with public recognition of what they're doing. Vander Linden showed in 2018 that a feeling of warm glow occurs with an easy behavior change, like getting rid of a plastic straw, but not for more drawn out behaviors. I doubt that you would get a warm glow for purchasing an energy efficient boiler, despite it being an important thing to do. One way to make change easy or make the undesired behavior hard is with nudges and choice architecture. The behavioral definition is a deliberate effort to change behavior by steering people in a particular direction while preserving freedom of choice. Nudges can be an effective way to initiate a change of behavior. Nudges can be mindful, helping people choose or mindless. Be judicious in using mindless nudges though. People have a strong dislike of feeling uh, tricked or losing control. They can be externally imposed or self-imposed if people are so motivated. They can encourage or discourage. Limitations of this approach are uh, first that changes are not long lasting. Use of social norms and social identity have been shown to last longer than a nudge. And nudges, in particular mindless nudges, can offend some groups in which perceived behavioral control is important. Choice architecture simplifies the act of choosing by organizing the context in which people make decisions. Ebeling and Lotz showed that if people's default choice was green or renewable energy, in other words, they had to opt out if they didn't want it, they were 10 times more likely to stick with it. Okay, now we're gonna try our new poll, our polling question one. I'm gonna read the question to you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just give you a couple sentences you're not seeing here. So the question is, Camille wants to reduce her meat consumption, cutting out meat two days a week. But every time she goes to the grocery store, she buys the same things. And even when she buys more veggies or vegetarian dishes, she doesn't use them. So there, you have five choices down below, which three suggestions would make it easier for Camille to change her habit? Okay, you can start to vote. We're gonna allow you one minute, so you gotta be quick on this.
Okay, I think we've got most of the responses in now, Carolee. All right. Um, I apologize it. if I cut anyone off, but we'll go ahead. And... Okay, um, the first answer is correct. You're absolutely right. Most people got that. That's great. Um, so remind yourself just before she starts to make dinner. Here's the problem. You, um, you want to encourage breaking a habit when people are mot so motivated to break a habit. If somebody's really hungry just before they start dinner, that's challenging time to convince them to switch uh, the way they make dinner. So um, that's why that answer is not correct. Abruptly switch to vegetarian, that is wrong. And the reason is um, it's actually better to make smaller changes uh, when you wanna change a habit smaller sort of incremental changes rather than be it so abruptly because you're likely to, to fail and have to start over. Hide the meat behind vegetables is correct and post a reminder is correct. Good job, everybody. Okay. Another key factor is social pressures. In group pressures to abide by social norms can cause both increased consumption and resistance to pro-environmental change. There are two types of social norms, descriptive norms, the perception of what others do, and injunctive norms, what people in a group approve of or avoid. An example of a descriptive norm is American men perceive pro-environmental behavior as more feminine than masculine. And an example of an injunctive norm is littering is bad. You can counter social pressures with social modeling, also called social influence. Social influence occurs when an individual's thoughts, feelings, or actions are influenced by other people or groups. Social modeling is particularly powerful when you identify credible authoritative messengers, identify charismatic agents of change in a community that can help to convey your message and help people to think of themselves as a member of a pro-climate in-group already. That's also called social labeling. We know that social influence works and it works for a number of pro-environmental behaviors, including energy conservation, choosing solar panels, sustainable transportation, and recycling. And individuals are more likely to engage in sustainable behavior if their in-group members do so too. So let's focus on social labeling, the bottom point for a minute. Seeing oneself as a typical recycler predicts recycling behavior above other variables, according to Minetti et al. The National Rifle Association use social labeling to a particularly powerful effect with ads showing all types of people stating that they were the NRA. We can do the same thing with climate change. We know the majority of the world care. Imagine an ad campaign showing people of all walks of life stating, I care about climate change and I vote, or I care about climate change and I buy from companies that show they do too, or I care about climate change and I act for climate change. Social modeling with positive social norms can really make a difference. An example in the marine world is using social norms as a nudge in a lab experiment using a common pool resource experimental design by McKay et al. to test compliance with recreational fishing limits. The individual quota for this experiment for individuals to catch was two and the maximum catch that, that individuals could catch was five. So the social norm statement that they provided in the experiment was according to last year's data, the average fisher chose to catch only one fish. Here the y-axis is the number of participants who complied and the x-axis shows the control on the bottom left and the three experimental conditions. The control is a low deterrence situation where people have a 5% chance of being caught with more than two fish and the three experimental conditions, low deterrence plus the social norm nudge, low de high deterrence if people had a 20% chance of being caught and high deterrence plus the social norm nudge. Well, I'm not showing you the figure, um, for all three experimental conditions, results were significant. Then McKay et al broke out people by different risk preferences. And that's the figure I'm showing you here. For the risk averse, the lighter bars, a social norm nudge alone significantly increased compliance from 34 to 48%. And in a high deterrence plus nudge situation, the bars on the far right, all groups significantly increased compliance. 
Recent research indicates that dynamic or trending social norms can greatly increase the percentage of people who perform a given behavior. A dynamic norm provides information about how other people's behavior is changing over time. Sparkman and Walton compared subjects' responses to dynamic versus static social norms used to encourage reducing meat consumption. The static norm statement was, 30% of Americans make an effort, effort to limit their meat consumption. And the dynamic norm statement was, in the last five years, 30% of Americans have now started to make an effort to limit their meat consumption. This figure shows that a dynamic norm approach nearly doubled the number of participants who ordered a meatless lunch after participating in the experiment. Here, the y-axis is percentage of participants who ordered a meatless lunch, and the x-axis shows the two conditions and a control. Another social influencing approach is the use of block leaders, volunteers from the community who inform others about a pro-climate action, ideally one that they've done themselves. Block leaders coupled with key promoter city leaders increased solar panel adoption tenfold. And the last social influencing approach is community intervention, a group of people from the same neighborhood or who have other aspects in common, such as ideology, environmental concerns, social group, et cetera, who voluntarily get together to change their behaviors like AA or Weight Watchers. Common elements include group setting, information sharing among the group or from experts and feedback. Effectiveness is 20% or more and the longevity of the effect was at least three years as shown by eco teams in the Netherlands. Two other factors hindering pro-climate behavior are whether we feel our actions matter, preventing action. In behavioral science, we call these factors perceived behavioral control and response efficacy, feeling like you have the ability to do something. And so perceived behavioral control is feeling like you have the ability to do something. Response efficacy is a person's beliefs as to whether the recommended action will actually make a difference. We all need to feel in control and effective to motivate action. I wanna make two points here. First, climate despair can arise from negative climate stories, which are not good starting points for action. Impact images increase fear and anger, which can backfire because people see no way out and then may ignore or deny the problem. This graph shows data from Feldman and Hart. Uh, the y-axis is a self-reported fear scale. The x-axis breaks out respondents by political ideology. Across political ideology, fear was highest when climate impacts alone were presented. That's the darker bars. And impacts alone reduced fear the most. That's the medium gray bars on the right. The results occurred across all groups. Thelman and Hart's data is backed up by O'Neill et al. 2013, who collected comments worldwide from people who viewed either climate impact images or climate action images. So if you already have an audience that's aware of climate impacts, such as the majority of people worldwide, you can focus on the solutions. Second, futility can arise if individuals perceive their efforts to be a drop in the bucket. People need to feel that their action is part of a broader collective. One tool to counter despair and futility is the emotional appeal of stories of hope and pride. As you just saw, action-oriented images increase hope. So does framing climate change as a public health issue and not an environmental one. And pride enhances feelings of effectiveness as shown by Antonetti and McClellan. Another tool for countering despair and futility is to increase public action with social norms and response efficacy. Public actions or periodic behaviors are those behaviors such as contacting government officials, voting, volunteering, including nature-based efforts to sequester carbon, protesting, or donating. Social norms and response efficacy explain 36 to 64 percent of the variance of public action, which is considerable. So how do you put this into practice? Well, you could create messages that X percent of people often engage in public climate action, that their involvement is critical and effective, that people's friends, family, neighbors engage in public action. And you can jumpstart this by starting to talk to family and friends yourself. Take heart in knowing most worry about climate change and want to address it. 
Okay, polling question two. We're gonna look at positive social norms. Which one message is best for encouraging an electric truck purchase by American football fans using a positive social norm? And the choices are, don't be like the others, being among the first to have an electric truck. Electric trucks save you and your family money. And electric trucks are powerful, says Rob Gronkowski, a famous football star. Okay, Carolee, I will. Uh, hey, let's uh, see. I think most people have had it. Chance. All right. Okay. You guys ace this one. You're absolutely right. So, if you want to use a positive social norm for this particular group, I saw the chat. Somebody doesn't like Rob Gronkowski. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to pick somebody that would work for this for this question, but um. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. You want to pick somebody that uh, is part of that in-group, essentially, somebody that they, that they deem credible. So very, very good job, people. Okay. Now we're going to consider the factors prohibiting action amongst the audience of those who are disengaged from climate change, doubt it exists, or dismiss the problem. Numerous studies have seen, shown that lack of knowledge is not an influencing factor for this group. Specific climate knowledge, personal assessment of climate knowledge, and numeracy are at reasonable levels for this group. What is an influencing factor here? Worldview, morals, social influence, and psychological reactance. There are four types of worldview. So worldview is the set of beliefs that people use to see and interpret the world in cultural theory. So Shui et al. says, so the four types are hierarchists that seek to maintain existing power structures that protect their interests. They fear social deviance that threatens the status quo and defer to experts who are also members of the dominant social orders. Individualists value their independence above all else and support free market solutions and providing opportunities for people to maximize personal gain. Fatalists believe that what happens in society is beyond their control. And egalitarians care about social injustice, are suspicious of authority, have a high tolerance for social freedoms and support participatory democracy and consensus-based decision-making. LaCroix and Gifford found that hierarchical or individual cultural worldviews are negatively correlated with climate change risk perception. Why is this? Cultural theory posits that hierarchists and individualists perceive things as threatening if they threaten their preferred cultural way of life and preferred structure of social organization or system justification. That may be why this group includes those who deny climate change. So hierarchists and individualists are reluctant to acknowledge climate risk because doing so could lead to regulation, thereby threatening existing power structures, autonomy, and the pursuit of personal financial gain. The second factor is moral foundations. The moral foundations of conservatives and liberals differ with some overlap. There are five overarching morals. In-group loyalty, loyalty to the group, purity, sanctity, physical or moral cleanliness, essentially the absence of disgust, physical or religious. And there are neurological differences between conservatives and liberals with respect to how they react to disgust. Authority, respect, respect for one's leaders. Fairness, reciprocity, concern for whether actions are fair and harm care, concern for whether actions harm others. Conservatives hold the top three morals, also called binding morals, more strongly, and they share the other two morals called individualizing morals, morals that protect individuals with liberals. Interestingly, fairness, reciprocity, and harm care messages predominate in the media, 
which may put off conservatives in articles and messages about climate change. Studies show that if you frame a climate story with other moral messages, you can broaden support for your message to conservatives. The third factor is social pressures prohibiting engaging in pro-climate behavior. If I made this change, I probably would be embarrassed when others noticed what I was doing. And the fourth and last factor is psychological reactance, an oppositional response to perceived pressure for change that occurs when a person believes a message threatens his or her agency or freedom. Obviously, this, this one is a hot topic right now because it, psychological reactance uh, is one of the factors causing barriers to mask wearing during COVID-19. Note that psychological reactance is not limited to conservatives. Liberals exhibit psychological reactance too, just to different topics. And psychological reactance can cause rejection of the messages or messenger. Tools for this audience include social norms, framing, and using the right messenger. One way to frame is to frame pro-environmental change as preserving rather than challenging the social system. Framing pro-environmental messages as patriotic eliminated the negative effect of system justification, supporting the current status quo on pro-environmental behavior. With respect to credible messenger, Republican messengers such as Republican senators, religious leaders, trusted community members speaking in favor of climate science and or climate policies are most effective in countering partisan information and tackling psychological reactance. A recent study by Commerson et al. from the Yale Program on Climate Communication showed that just listening to uh, the look at the set, the top seven stories here, just listening to a single 90 second radio story featuring Republicans discussing climate change concern or climate actions significantly increased conservatives' perception that Republicans as a group worried about global warming. Okay, next polling question. Okay, now we're gonna go back to, you have to remember this, we're gonna go back to dynamic social norms. Which one message is best for encouraging an electric truck purchase by football fans using a dynamic social norms? And your choices are, I just bought an electric truck, says Margot Robbie, a famous actress. In the last two years, more young guys have been buying electric trucks and everyone is buying electric trucks. Okay, Carolee, I'm gonna- Okay, uh, let's see. You guys aced it. You're absolutely right. So the part B is um, dynamic because it's more young guys have been buying. So it's showing a, a trend in that particular behavior and that uh, we are simple creatures at heart. And that seems to be ex especially effective for people. Okay, next. Thanks, Sarah. The next factor is cognitive biases. I've categorized the most important ones here. First, we discount the future and favor the present, present bias and future discounting. These are some of the toughest factors we have prohibiting climate action. Secondly, we rationalize behaviors that are inconsistent with our worldview, identity, or behavior, cognitive dissonance. Third, we seek information that confirms our worldview and oppose information that does not confirmation bias, motivated reasoning, and commitment bias. And fourth, we simplify decision-making with cognitive shortcuts that may prove faulty, single action bias and dual process reasoning. Single action bias is people's tendency to respond to the need to take action by making just one change, such as hoarding toilet paper during COVID-19. Making that change reduces guilt and worry and makes further action less likely. Dual process reasoning incorporates the two different types of human decision-making processes. System one takes cognitive shortcuts, makes assumptions and is rapid. And system two is a deliberate rational process. I have time to show you just one tool to counter one cognitive bias. The tool to counter present bias is legacy motivation shown to be the most important reason for environmental concern 
enhancing climate change beliefs, pro-environmental intent, and donations. In 2002, the Biodiversity Project surveyed people across the United States with the question of what motivates them to care for the environment. The majority, 62%, that's 39% in this bar and 23% in this bar, did so because of stewardship, be it stewardship for future generations or stewardship for God's creation. Two outreach and communication tools to affect behavior change are storytelling and framing. Let's face it, we're storytelling apes. People remember stories more than they do facts. A compelling story is one that is simple, emotional, personal, and rings true because people remember what they feel. Framing is a conceptual structure we use in thinking. Reframing with the morals of your specific audience can really make a difference. Feinberg and Willer showed that framing global warming statements as purity increased pro-environmental attitudes amongst conservatives over any other moral. And Walsko, Walsko et al. explored the impact of framing with in-group binding values, which include authority, respect, and purity, versus individualizing moral values. Remember, that's fairness and harm care. In the individualizing condition, participants read the following statement, an excerpt of which is shown here. Show your love for all of humanity and the world in which we live by helping to care for our vulnerable natural environment. Show your compassion. In the binding condition, they read, show you love your country by joining the fight to protect the purity of America's natural environment. Show your patriotism. On this graph, the y-axis is the climate change composite, including pro-climate attitudes, intentions, donations, and perceived message strength. The x-axis shows the control and two conditions, the individualizing condition and the binding condition. The blue dots are strong liberals, the red conservatives separated by one standard deviation on a political orientation scale. You can see that by framing the message as binding brought conservatives basically up to the same value as liberals. You can frame messages selectively to generate more positive responses across ideology. This table from the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions shows the words that appeal to those with either a promotion or a prevention focus, the former being more appropriate for liberals, the latter conservatives. Good words to use for liberals are aspirational words like promote, aspire, support, nurture. Good words to use for conservatives are words like responsibility, duty, obligation, and defend. Framing messages selectively on renewable energy can also garner support. This modified figure from Gustafson et al. shows which messages appeal to Republicans, Democrats, or both groups to support renewable energy. The x-axis is the percentage responding that a message was extremely or very important. The red bars are Republicans scoring, the blue bars Democrat. As the red arrow shows, close to the least compelling reason for Republicans to, for, to get renewable energy were to reduce global warming. In contrast, two of the most positive messages for Republicans were to reduce energy costs or reduce water or air pollution. Now take a look at the blue arrow for Democrats. The most, one of the most positive responses, messages for Democrats to get renewable energy is to reduce global warming. <laughs> so, but you can see there are messages that would work well for both groups like to reduce water or air pollution. Okay, last polling question. Which two messages would work best to encourage climate action by American or the rest of the world conservatives? Protect the American way of life by reducing energy use, nurture our country's wild spaces and stop climate change, stop climate injustice and advance energy opportunities in our community. It's our right to have strong communities unthreatened by climate change. Pick two of those messages that work best for them. Okay, Carolee, I'll, I'll cut it. All right. Let's see. 
You're absolutely right. You guys, you guys are acing this. That's perfect. Yep, you picked the right words for conservatives. You're absolutely right. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, and some here are 10 tips from the Behavioral Science Toolbox for Climate Action. First, identify the audience, target behavior, influencing factors and tools, prototype and evaluate. You can match the right tool to the barriers and benefits graph identified for your audience with the barriers benefit graph I showed you. Offer choices for action, make change easy using nudge and choice architecture is one way to do it. Encourage prompts, goal setting and public commitments. Use emotional appeals, countering despair with hope and pride. Counter fight futility by encouraging high impact climate action, the collective and public action. Socially influence using peers, social groups, block leaders, and influencers to model behavior. Counter cognitive biases. Tell stories to make climate change personally relevant. And frame messages to broadly held moral values or selectively held values for a particular audience. Intrinsic motivators like these provide a sense of satisfaction, self-efficacy, and connectedness. So to put what you've learned into practice, Here's a summary of the highest priority action, priority actions identified for the Great Barrier Reef from a Delphi review by diverse stakeholder experts, ranging from NGOs to government to tourism operators. And for each high priority action, I've provided suggested behavior tools to apply. Now notice that the number one category, the most important action that these experts thought was, was relevant for the Great Barrier Reef was political actions. And I showed you that suggested behavioral tool here is social norms and response efficacy. Secondly, education. I didn't mention it, but when you have somebody that's particularly uh, opposed to what you're doing, the first step really is to listen, to listen to their perspective and try to hear what their fears are. Second, make it personal, consider values. Energy use, you can use the energy tips I showed you. Household and daily behaviors, you use the tools to break habits and philanthropy legacy motivation, although legacy motivation applies to a lot more than just philanthropy. To close, and someday our children and our children's children will look at us in the eye and they'll ask us, did we do all that we could when we had the chance to deal with this problem and leave them a cleaner, safer, more stable world? And I wanna be able to say, yes, we did. Don't you want that? Thank you. I put my contact info here below and I can take questions now. Sarah's gonna moderate that. Fantastic, Carolee, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we already have some questions. Um, so I'll, st I'll start in with those and feel free to send more. We'll do as many as we have, we have time for. Um, there was a question that came in, does the methodology and result map, this was fairly early on in the presentation, okay. map across different demographic groups and access to personal wealth? Sorry, could you ask that question again? Does the methodology, uh, does the methodology and result map, um, are, I think the, the question is, uh, do the results that you presented sort of early, um, do they apply to, are they sort of universal like amongst the converted, dem the converted yes, demographic groups and, and relative to personal wealth? Um, I would imagine so. So the Yale, that, so that data is from the Yale Center for Climate Communication and they, they do this analysis every year. Um, and they break it out into multiple demographic group, groups. And then they also research uh, more using those same types of questions. So I would look there, but I would imagine it is tied to some degree to personal wealth. Okay, great, thank you. And sort of a similar question um, about age. Um, let's see. Are there word choices, moral foundations that seem to be most effective for inspiring action in youth? Um, are they different from adults? Ask that one more time, Sarah, sorry. Um, are there word choices or moral foundations that seem to be most effective for inspiring action in youth? Are they different from adults? That's an interesting question. I think, you know, it is troubling to see the moral foundations theory to see that uh, climate justice puts off conservatives. Um, because if uh, you'll notice, and I mentioned that, that much of the media, that's what they focus on is climate justice. And it's really an important topic. But you have to know the audience that you're talking to. So where you want to be broader, I would probably uh, highlight the other morals too. Um, to try to reach a broader audience. If you just focus on climate justice, you will put it off. However, 
uh, probably, I, I, I don't have data on this, so I'm just speculating that probably the younger generation is more likely to favor uh, concepts of climate justice. Um, uh, but that's a good question. Okay, and uh, yeah, another one sort of along those lines. Um, is there a difference in effectiveness for social modeling or norms when the message comes from people you know, that is such as neighbors, uh, versus people you don't know, such as people on a television commercial? Yeah, I mean, it depends on uh, your demographics as well. Basically, it comes down to who you trust. And um, I think it's uh, particularly fascinating and relevant to see who is trusted in this COVID-19 uh, debate. You would have thought, uh, you know, Fauci and top uh, scientists and top uh, public health doctors would be respected, but it appears that, uh, you know, the more local doctor is, is better accepted um, you know, for people that are opposed to getting a vaccine. So um, whenever you do a behavior change uh, approach, you have to prototype and evaluate. So you may go with some assumptions and your assumptions may, re may really be wrong. You might pick a particular speaker and then you find people are turned off by that speaker. Um, we had, when I was leading the NSF exhibit at the aquarium, um, on aquatic biodiversity. It was called Living Links, Choices for Survival. And we were exploring the way to present the information. And we did uh, focus group analyses. We thought maybe we could do kind of in your face text, you know, sort of like, um, uh, like some of the comedians at the time that were doing, that were doing commercials. Um, but it turned out that presenting um, bad news about the environment in an in-your-face way did not uh, really irritate people. So that, that didn't work at all. And we ended up finding that we had to have for, for the best approach that we had for the exhibit was sort of informal, informal style of talking. So it wasn't quite so, um, uh, so boring in the way that the text was presented and that seemed to work out the best. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Carolee. Um, from another questioner, um, thank you for this very thorough and timely webinar. Much of the focus seems to be on targeting behavior changes at the individual lifestyle level. We know the climate crisis is driven by multinational corporations and large institutions. To get these actors to change their behaviors requires strong political pressure. How can we use these lessons about individual behavior change to encourage individuals to join in advocating for political action and policy change? Yeah, very good question. That's why I spent the two slides showing you the importance of public action. And this particular uh, course that we've developed is for individual and collective action. But the next course that I'm working on about halfway through at this point will be on policy and institutional change. So then we're really looking at how to scale this up uh, to, to broader groups. That's I, I did provide that slide at the very beginning with extra Moser on how behavior, behavioral factors affect institutions. Um, and I think it is critical to think through uh, the path dependencies limiting institutions. But with all that said, I do disagree with say Michael Mann um, that it, you know, some people have criticized individual action as greenwashing. However, the studies show the AP NORC poll in 2019 um, showed that if those who felt their own actions made an effect on climate change had a 40% greater response towards all actors playing a role. So that if you get people feeling like they're making a difference with public action um, and talking to their family and friends, and they see a groundswell of support, that will um, actually aid the public uh, support that we need for these policy changes. We need, we need changes at all levels, absolutely. And I think, um, and so that's why I will focus the next course. It'll include, it'll include a bit on social capital. It'll include something on scaling up um, and, uh, and then looking at how to affect policy change with behavior change. Um, and one of our attendees um, added, look at Greg Sparkman's latest paper. It shows that personal behavior change also can lead to broader political action. I absolutely agree with Carol on this. It is a false dichotomy. Thank you. 
I look forward to taking a look at that paper. It's really hard to stay on top of the literature, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's the that's the big one of the biggest challenges. But um, I'm really excited about it, and I think that you know the the health uh, profession. Um, as a whole, public health as a whole has recognized the importance of behavior change decades ahead of the environmental community. And we need to um, recognize that this is not, um, you know, a specialty effort. This needs to be part and parcel of everything that we do to make the changes required for this climate crisis. Um, and well, and that, and that message came from Heidi Zamzow. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, who's also doing research in this area. And she posted the, a link to that article in the Q&A. So I just posted in the uh, chat for everyone if they wanted to That's check great. out the paper. Oh, you know, we have four minutes left. Can I just show the um, the drivers for the phishing since I said- Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, all right, hold on. Um, oh, right here. So I, I have uh, simplified this table, but this is from, um, uh, I think Batista et al. Let me see. Just modified from Batista et al. And so uh, they call them drivers. This is looking at the behavioral interventions for illegal fishing. Um, I've changed it to factors, but they're this one and the same. Um, and so you can see that uh, so factors, self interest, perceptions, and beliefs, and lack of knowledge. And then these are the interventions that they propose. You can see how many of them really are related to a social norm. Um, and social modeling of some sort. So I thought that just might be helpful. I will say, um, looking at the marine literature, um, I, I am struck by how few papers there are out there on using behavior change in marine conservation. Um, I would say RARE is doing some work in yeah. this space, um, also EDF. Um, Willow Batista was actually on the webinar earlier, but had to hop off and she left her, her email address in the chat um, if anybody wanted to get in touch with her about this work too. Great. Okay. Um, here's a question. Uh, what approach do you suggest might work for a long established government organization dedicated to the environment, but the wheels are huge and slow to turn? Well, um, having worked in a long established government organizations myself, um, you know, it's funny, uh, just like anything, we, we jump on bandwagons. And so uh, nudges have gotten an enormous amount of attention in government agencies. And, uh, and I have pointed out, you know, there are pros and cons to nudges. Um, and we have to focus on other things as well. But it's, um, I, you know, I think we need to, I don't know what country you're, you're asking the question about, but um, Certainly under the Obama administration, they had a behavioral science uh, group that was dedicated to exploring behavioral insights, largely from behavioral economics. Um, our course is both transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary because I think you do need to go beyond behavioral economics um, uh, to make a difference on behavior change. But um, ho however you can encourage getting behavior uh, change cried out by that group would be the way to go and to highlight the values uh, from the health uh, sector where they've applied behavior change and it's worked um, and, and, and case studies in the environmental sector where it's worked as well. Okay, thank you, Karen Lee. You're welcome. Um, one last question before we go. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on what political actions you think would be most effective and where, how we should focus our efforts. Thank you. Wow. Um, it was a big one. I mean, the thing is, we have to um, we have to affect action in multiple areas simultaneously. I'm I uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm fairly alarmed. <laughs> Here, I'm trying to present all the positive aspects, and I'm fairly alarmed. But um, but um, I will share with you that my grandfather was Roger Revell, who presented information on climate change in actually to the Truman administration and um, first wrote about it in 1957 in uh, Scientific American. And I am alarmed by how long it's taking for us to actually act. Um, I think, you know, obviously uh, you, you take a look at 
I think the project drawdown, the drawdown reviews are really good. You can take a look at the highest priority actions at a global level. Um, uh, we have to have enforcement and validity. I'm all for um, uh, nature-based approaches to carbon sequestration, but they have to be uh, uh, re real and present approach present threats to that to that land to count as a carbon offset. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously, uh, transportation is a huge factor, it depends on your country, but in the US, uh, transportation is a huge factor, we have to encourage uh, as much as possible making that switch. Um, and then uh, talk it really, I think one of the biggest things is just feeling comfortable enough to talk about it with your friends and family, and try to get everybody to uh, do the, the recommended cuts that would be sort of the equivalent at an individual level of the Paris Agreement. You know, when, when Biden, uh, uh, right now, you could, under a current Paris Agreement, you could cut at one ton of CO2 a year, essentially, as an individual, and that would be all you need to cut. But that's going to, uh, you would have to double that at least for 2030, and even worse by 2050. So I think we really have to, um, uh, both be optimistic and convey hope because humans are capable of great things um, and convey that, uh, you know, look what we did to the ozone um, layer and, and, and having an international response to that. Look at great art. We are capable of great things. We have to do this in the next 10 years. Okay. Thank you, Carolee. Thank you. Um, I posted again the, the two links. One, or let's see. I'm just finished the second one. Uh, one to the full course. Carolee chopped out so much amazing information. She had an incredibly hard time doing it. So okay. I would highly encourage you to take the full course so you can get all of that and move through everything slowly and to pull it in and talk, discuss it more. Uh, so this was just a teaser for the full course. We highly encourage you, the links in the chat, uh, to check that out. And also the, the recording of this webinar will be available at the link I just posted in the chat, the other link I posted in the chat um, within 24 hours and feel free to watch again and share. Carolee, thank you so much. I know you put an incredible amount of work into this presentation to chop it thank down you. for us. And <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> we, we've received amazing feedback already on the webinar and we really, really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. I, I so appreciate talking to this audience people after my own heart. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you everyone. And, and, and hopefully we, we, we will all work smarter now having learned <laughs> uh, what Carolee had to share. Okay. Bye okay. everyone. All right. Bye everybody. Thank you.